Father, we surrender to your will. We surrender to the plan you have for us. The word you will speak over us. The changes that you will make in us. The joys that you will restore. The peace that shall give us great comfort. Make the crooked straight, the rough places plain. Exalt the valleys and abase the mountains. But most of all, let your glory be seen, experienced here and now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. We greet you in the adorable and matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who orders our steps and gives us the right to be. Others perhaps would have dismiss you and have dismissed you but the Lord loves for you to be in his presence and he loves to be in your presence and so for that reason I think that we all owe God a, a, a sincere appreciation of thanksgiving that such a holy God allows such an imperfect people to stand before him to worship him and to praise him so can you just glorify him and thank him for this moment Amen. I, I, I want to get into the word as we are in this series entitled Breathe Again. Uh, and, and simply it just reiterates to us that in life, no matter how saved we are, we always need a new breath, the spirit of Ruach of God to blow upon us. Um, if, if you've been in anything long enough uh, and you aren't careful, it becomes a, a, a little boring to you. Uh, it becomes to the point where you and I take things for granted. Uh, and, if, and if we have done it with each other, we have definitely done it with God. And if we have done it with God, we have definitely done it with each other. And so breathe again simply says that you ought to take a moment uh, and recognize that no matter what has happened, what is happening, God gives you a new breath. Uh, and we can breathe again. Last week was an exhilarating week. It was a tough week. Uh, we eulogized one of our faithful members, uh, Mother Susie Brandon, um, such a devoted believer and hearts are still uh, praying for the family. And likewise, the uh, other day we lost another one of our members is, is losing some good people. Um, uh, we lost um, one of our faithful members, Sister Denise, Blackwell, some of you saw her at Sam's Club greeting people with pepper and salt hair. Um, she's gone on to be with God. You know, last night, uh, after 40 years of um, uh, a close friend to die, one of my line brothers died last night. We were together last weekend in Norfolk State Homecoming, and we spent Friday and Saturday with our families together. And uh, this weekend, uh, he has made his exodus from this life into another. And, and that is a very challenging moment. But somebody say, but God. Thank you so much. Come on. I want to share with you, um, and I, I told Shelly this morning, Shelly, I'm not at my best. I'm not perhaps prepared this morning. And then I look out and see my aunt and my cousins and family members. So I'm saying I thank God for um, the support and prayers and their presence. I, I want to share this morning with you from uh, the first book of the Bible, which is, <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Somebody know it is Genesis. 
Um, it is the first book of the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch, the first five books written by Moses, uh, where Moses records through the sages. Uh, Moses hears from his sages about creation. Moses pens the, uh, the Pentateuch that we might have a written understanding of the world order and how God simply is the orchestrator, the author of everything that is. And so Genesis chapter four, uh, will you share with me, uh, it'll be on the screen as well uh, as your smart devices or your Bible. Genesis chapter four, I really want to talk about today this covenant that we are in with God. It is on his end unbreakable. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of y'all would get excited over that, but those of us who recognize how imperfect we are, we ought to shout a little higher, a little louder than anyone else. But for those of you who are, you know, you know, you are really saved and you got everything right. Perhaps this doesn't fit you. But for those of us who are still getting to know God, and it is a wonderful journey to get to know God. And I have come to the conclusion, as much as I know about him, I still don't know enough about him. <laughs> Y'all help me with this word today. Mm. We talked last week about Rahab and how Rahab, uh, the harlot, uh, the prostitute, uh, the whore, the hoe. I mean, some of y'all can't handle truth. I mean, that's what it was. But how she felt the spirit of God and protected two of Israel's spies. God saved her and her family. I wish some of you would just get beyond your past. You've been dancing with a corpse too long, trying to have intercourse with something that's already dead that cannot produce to you anything new. I'm sorry. Mm. Come on, Genesis chapter four. Uh, let's look at verse 13. Really, it's, it's, it's the entire chapter, but let's, let's start at verse 13. Uh, we find ourselves now where... Cain and Abel, uh, the sons of Adam and Eve. Um, and you have to understand the writing because people always ask the question, well, when Cain left, where, where did he go? How did he find a wife? What Moses does is Moses tries to take the story from the sages and simply put in a letter or book something that would give us an understanding that God was sovereign, that whatever was was because of God. It, it doesn't always match up with what goes on, but it just simply says that the first man, the first human beings were created by God and God did it and it was God. That's all Moses is trying to convey to us that if it, if, if it happened, it happened because God spoke it. God said, let there be, and God spoke it into existence that lets us know the power uh, that is on our tongue of life and death. So Cain, cocaine, here we find now that and we'll walk you through as best we can. Verse 13, Genesis 4, it says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Of course, this is after Cain kills Abel and God chastises him. He says, my punishment is more than I can bear. Mm. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. Well, I should have thought about that before. Let's go. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. 
Some of y'all ought to shout right now and thank God because you are glad that what goes around does not always come around. <laughs> okay, y'all just, y'all got to help me today. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. I, I, I want to reread this part, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. You ought to just shout, thank God for the mark. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. Um, really, I, I thank God for the mark. Thank God for the mark. I believe that God is still saying today to all of us who are willing to confess that he still got us. I don't know what level of joy that brings you, but to know that God still has me. Okay, some of y'all are just not getting it already, but I'm ready to go home just off that. That God still got me. I, I, I looked at the story throughout the week and it just didn't fall into place as it has for the last two weeks in preaching. But this story is about the sons of Adam and Eve, two brothers. Cain is the eldest and of course, Abel is the youngest of the brothers. Perhaps there could have been girls involved and females involved, but the Bible doesn't explicitly tell us because to have a male child was something to be honored and privileged in a very sexist and misogynistic community. Girls, females were seen as less as important, even though they are the ones who gave life to the males. We find that these brothers, if you pray with us in this historical account, these brothers, like many other siblings, at some point just didn't get along. I, as the only child, marvel at brothers and sisters uh, when I find it challenging that they don't get along. As the only child, I would have loved to have been around anybody who had my DNA or the DNA from my father. But because I only have the narrative of being a only child, I don't know the hiccups of being involved in a civil rivalry. The Bible tells us stories after stories about siblings not getting along. It appears over and over, unfortunately, uh, when you even look at Shem and Ham, when you look at Isaac and Ishmael, when you look at Jacob and Esau, when you look at Joseph and his brothers who sold him into slavery after they lifted him from a pit, and even when you consider even the life of Jesus and his siblings who didn't honor him as the Messiah because they were so familiar with him playing catch or hopscotch in the street. They were so familiar that they couldn't understand the level of anointing that God had placed on Jesus and many others that they found themselves in a squabble fighting one another when God blessed them to be together. This story of Cain and Abel is a story not of murder. And many of us think about how Cain killed his brother and that is an awful, awful deed. 
but this story isn't about murder. It's not a story about a homicide. It, it, is, it is a story about a sidetracked brother who devalued human life. It, 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 is, it, is, it is not about murder because murder is the consequence or the result of dishonoring that which God had already given. I hope you pray with me. I, I, I've never murdered anyone, but I suspect that most of us, if not all of us, have hurt somebody through some own actions that we have taken or words that we have spoken. Y'all help me please. This is not a story of just a homicide, the first homicide, the first murder, the first premeditated murder, but it is really a reality of how God shows grace and mercy. And whether we like it or not, it's a story about your life and how God may grant mercy to those who cause you some injury. Mm, Y'all, please help me. It opens up with us today as we examine the details of the story. Many of you know that. Many of you learned this in Sunday school of how, how God allowed Cain and Abel to present him with gifts. This particular story is deeply troubling both now and then because God allows us to present gifts, but it is God who distinguishes what gifts are accepted. Y'all help me, I'm coming, y'all. It is, it, is, it, is, it is not me pushing down the throat of a holy God what I desire him to accept, but it is rather God weighing what I have been blessed with and then present him with that he either rejects it or receives it. This Bible is, 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 is something because we find that in the course of time that Cain and Abel present God their first fruit. Abel brought God an offering, fat portions from his livestock as a shepherd. Cain, on the other hand, was a farmer. And the Lord, the word says in verse 4 of Genesis that the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Verse 5, y'all still with me. Verse 5, it says, but on Cain and his offering, God did not look with favor. So Cain becomes very angry and his face was downcast. Stay with me. Then in verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? The Lord confronts Cain's anger. Not that anger is a sin, but God is wondering, why are you angry over my decision not to accept your gift? Could it be that Cain is more like us or we are more like Cain that we want God to accept our plan before we pray and get a plan from him. I don't know where I'm going with this, Shelly, but y'all got to pray with me and help me out today with this sermon. But Cain's offering was not accepted and God confronts him as he will confront us. He says, why are you angry and why is your face looking so devastated? Verse seven, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do, if you do not do what is right, listen, it says sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. This sounds like the New Testament writer who says, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. Then, then he says in verse 7, but you must rule over it. What is God referring to when he tells Cain, you can fix your face because you can fix your gift? 
What you give to me, what you offer me, how you worship me, how you praise me must be accepted by me. Don't help me. And if, say if, if I say I'm not happy with your presentation, don't become angry, change. Okay, I know. I know this is so simple, isn't it? Isn't it simple? Isn't it simple? God says, I receive Abel, and there are many theologians who wonder, why would God receive Abel gift from the livestock and not Cain's gift from the ground? And, and, and many people have, have given their conjectures about why God did it, but all I can say is the Bible doesn't give us evidence of why God chose to do what God chose to do, other than God is sovereign. Now y'all, y'all help me. I'm, 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 I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I struggle with how God expresses His sovereignty. <laughs> why, why, why do you permit what you can prevent? I'm just talking to myself today, it's just me. Well, how, how can you be God and not, and, and not quickly intervene in moments of oppression? Abel, Abel had faith. Not to say that Cain didn't have faith. The Bible didn't say that Cain didn't have faith. It just said that God did not accept Cain's gift nor his attitude. Now, we can make up things and say, well, maybe Abel was a man of God. He loved God with all his heart. Maybe he, maybe he shouted hallelujah is the highest praise. Maybe he said everything, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. I don't know, but, but it doesn't say that. But it does say that God received it, but he did not receive Cain's gift. Maybe he knew something about the mental and spiritual and, and emotional condition of the one he rejected. Maybe it's not in what you present. Y'all help me. Maybe it's not in what you present, but maybe God is going a little deeper wanting you to connect to the one you are giving to. Okay, that didn't make sense. Y'all help me. Oh, y'all. Um, 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 help me, help me, help me. Okay. He, he may have had faith in the existence of power, the bounty of God, but God wanted a heart that would repent. You know, sometimes God would just see how we're going to handle something to see if our testimony is really the truth or is it just a test of lie. Sometimes God will put us to the test to see if we are as committed to him as we expose to everyone else that we love the Lord. Mm, yeah, yeah. And the Lord says, well, let me see how much you love me when I accept your brother's gift, but not your gift. Let me see how much you love me when I tell you no. And I refuse you to push down my throat what you think I want to receive. Let me see how you're going to act when I don't do things the way you prayed, but do things the way in which I want to groom you and prune you and grow you. Okay, y'all, 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 this, 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 this is, this is something here. We must understand that sometimes God's no is about his sovereignty. And, and, and sometimes trying to figure it out will have you wasting time when you and I are not adequate to figure out what God does permit. And so one of the things we have to start doing is, is learning not to linger at the why God, but the what God. What is it that you need me to see? What is it that you need me to experience? 
What is it that you need me to change? What is it that you need me to do? What is it, God, that you need me to have discernment over? It's not the why, it's the what now, what now, what now? Where, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? This is, this is God's sovereignty. So Moses doesn't give us an answer to why God rejected it. Even though throughout the years we have given our opinions of why God rejected his, we can't be afraid. Listen, we can't be afraid to trust a God that we cannot anticipate. You know what? I, one of the reasons that I get so disenchanted with church today in the 21st century, one of the reasons I get disenchanted is we got this, this potluck gospel. You know what a potluck gospel? Whatever you want to bring, just bring it and we're going to eat it. No, 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 no. But when you have a covenant with God, you can't eat everybody's potato salad. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. You know, no, who, who made this? Who, who, who made it? No, no. I can't eat that because she ain't, he ain't. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. So we have a gospel that is a potluck gospel that says anyhow, anyhow, anyway, but it's not that. There are some traditions we cannot afford to lose or the church will lose the power of the head who is Jesus Christ. And we cannot, I'm sorry, y'all. We cannot afford to have a meltdown, milk down, water down gospel. The gospel was made through the blood of Jesus. I'm sorry, y'all. We, we, God, God can't always be anticipated. And we want to put God in a box and say, in three days, he'll do this. And this is your season of that. That's why you don't hear me telling y'all that this is your season. Because I don't know what season y'all in. I know what season Grove is in, but I don't know what season you're in as an individual. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie to make you feel comfortable to stay where you are and then keep coming back. The hard reality is this, that sometimes we don't know what God is doing. But I got to trust him. I got to trust him. I gotta trust him because I read in his word that he's trustworthy. I've experienced in my personal life that he's trustworthy. I heard mama and daddy tell me he's trustworthy. I heard many of you tell me he's trustworthy. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get here. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Y'all gonna sit down. God, God, God will not be tamed or controlled by your immediate impulses, nor our narration of our events. God cannot and will not be reduced to our ideas of what he should do, how he should do it, and when he will do it. The last time I checked, it was God who stepped out on nothing and said, let there be. Well, yeah, this narration is something because we all like to narrate our own events telling God what we want rather than letting God tell us what he desires in our hearts through discernment and through wisdom. God can't be reduced and God will not be reduced and I don't understand God. I don't always like what God does, but I got to trust him more than I trust my dislike. I don't know why God would take a colon power and leave a Donald Trump. I don't know. I don't know why he would take 
a Susan Brandon and leave a Donald Trump. I don't know why he would take a Martin Hampton rainbow and then leave Lindsey Graham. I don't know. But, but perhaps they will say the same thing about me. Why would God take me when he could take Melvin Mariner? Because all of us are imperfect beings, deserving of death, but God, his grace, his mercy. The real issue in this story is I try to make some sense of this story today. The real issue in this story isn't just trying to get to the why, but it is learning how to honor and respect the sovereignty of God. That's what it's about. We can shout and do all the stuff we do in church, but if we don't trust the sovereignty of God, to say, God, do what you will. It may not feel good, but do what you will. I may not like it at the end of the day, but I know where Romans said, all things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord and call according to his purpose. It didn't feel good. It didn't taste good. I didn't like it, but God knows it showed up bless me by and by. So as I look at this story and I try to bring some, some direction to where you should be going with this. Cain had a lapse. Not only was his gift not accepted, but then Cain gets angry to the point where he now thinks about sin. And there's nothing wrong with getting angry. Some of you church folk don't get angry enough. And that's why things don't change. Because we just go along to get along. And sometimes you gotta be the hiccup in the room in order to bring about true change. Okay, okay, yo, okay, okay, okay. I'm almost there, Shelly, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. He failed to respond to God properly. It is not what people do to us. We cannot always stop what they do. Not always. Not always. Let me say it again on this side. Not always. There are some things you can stop by changing your playground, your playmates, and your play things. <laughs> Y'all help me somebody, okay, I'm sorry. If, 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 if you know the person has the tendency of doing this and hurting you, then you got to make sure that you now understand their tendencies and guard yourself and your heart so they won't do it again. The first time, shame on you. The second time, shame on me for not seeing that you have been changed. Okay, y'all stay with me. Cain's countenance failed. He becomes angry over rejection, and none of us like rejection. He becomes angry, but not only anger, his anger then leads him to sin. It's okay to be angry. Be angry, but sin not. It's okay to be angry. Don't listen to believers who tell you, don't get angry. No, there are reasons when you ought to get angry. But Channel your anger. Anybody ever had uncontrolled anger? All y'all should raise your hand because you're lying right now. All of us have uncontrolled anger where we did not present the best of who we were. Y'all got mighty quiet now. It's okay when it's on the other foot, right? But now it's on yours. But, but here it is because we all have had uncontrolled anger that now he takes his anger out on God, but not only on God, he takes his anger out on the one God created. And what God was doing, I told this thing to the shout, what God was doing was challenging Cain's self-awareness of his internal struggle. Failure to respond properly will produce a loss of joy and happiness. Anger is often a reaction to hurt pride. 
a defense mechanism used to protect our ego. So therefore, when I'm hurt, my next thought is, how can I get you back? That's pride. Mm, okay, y'all y'all sleep now. And if you allow anger to lead you, then you are jeopardizing your joy and or your happiness. When you fail to honor God and responding properly, you will reproduce the loss of holiness. Uncontrolled anger, if it is not directed correctly, will bring out evil thoughts or motives that are lurking in your subconscious. Now, I know you're saved. I know you've been born again. I know you speak in tongues. I know you interpret tongues. But all of us got some dark moments and some dark places. Oh, yeah. So, so, look, look, look at your neighbor. Don't, don't get too close. Just say, you too, you too, you too. We all got some dark places in our lives that have been uncultivated. Say, say you too. No, I don't say you too. You too. We, we, we all, come on now, I'm being real. We all got some places that have not yet been made submissive to God. And if the right or wrong thing happens, that thing will creep up and you're going to ask yourself where it come from. It's been there all the time. Okay, let me, let me, let me try to close this thing. Um, it, when you don't respond properly, you also produce the loss of hope, hopefulness. Hopefulness is important because if, once you lose hope, then it's all over. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you don't have anything to hope for, then you have nothing to attach your faith to. Faith needs something that is not in your current reality, that is in your later on, your tomorrow or your next year that says keep hoping because God will never, God will never come short of his promise to you. But faith needs something to hold on to. I'm, I'm almost there. And once you start uh, to walk in uncontrolled anger, when you're really mad at God for telling you you couldn't have something that you wanted, you in turn take it out on your siblings. I'm not talking just about your physical siblings. I'm talking about your spiritual siblings. Church folk ought to get along a little bit better than the world. <laughs> I'm not even going there with y'all today. I'm not even going there with y'all today. But church folk ought to get along a little better and we ought not keep dogging each other in the same body of Christ. But when jealousy... Envy, malice, creep in. You can do almost anything. So here it is, here it is. I gotta move on, move on. I'm almost there, I'm, I'm gonna just cut it short. Because now God, God is, is, is asking, a, asking Cain, Cain, if you do what Abel has done, you will get what Abel got. You will be rewarded as well. But Cain did not heed, listen to your church, Cain did not heed God's word. If you do what Abel has done, you will get a Cain's blessing. See, if you do what Abel has done in presenting the gift with the right attitude and handling my rejection, because God will not always give us what we want. And so here it is now, if you can handle God's no, because of his sovereignty and his grace in your life, then God says that I will give you Cain's blessings. See, you can't get my blessing. No, no, I can't get yours. Whatever God meant for you, guess what? My enemy can't take it away. I can put it in their hands or their lap. The enemy can't take what God is going to bless me with, but I can surrender it. 
Okay, I'm sorry. This is too. This is it. Come on, come on, come on, Matt. I'm, I'm closed. I promise y'all I'm closing. It's time to go. You ain't got to go home. I just love to say that, but it is. But notice something in conclusion. This is something. When they were in the field, the Bible says that Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. You only kill what you have no value in. It was selfish. He did it out of wounded pride. Jealousy and a guilty conscience. And when you don't allow God to handle your attitude, you simply multiply the deeds of darkness. And Cain rose up and he killed his brother Abel who came out of the same womb. And we debate, I don't anymore, we debate whether we should call black on black crime, black on black crime. Well, there's no such thing as black on black crime. There's no, no white on white crime. You can debate that all you want to. Too many black folk killing one another. Too many white folk killing one another. Too many Hispanics. Whatever you want to call it. I ain't got time for semantics when we dying. We got to figure out, why are you killing me? Have I done something that treacherous that my life becomes nothing to you? Or is it just you just don't like yourself that you can't like me? So maybe it's not about bling bling. That's old expression. Maybe it's not about uh, the, the rims of cars or radio. That's, that's the old stuff. No, maybe it's about love. Showing our young girls and our young men what love is. Letting them know how much they are valued, not doesn't matter where they live. It doesn't matter if they are farmers or if they are shepherds. We created the monsters of lower class, middle class, and upper class to distinguish the haves from the have-nots. We did that. And the church is just as guilty as the world. We fight over who's a bishop, who's a pastor, who's a reverend doctor, who's a, I mean, come on, church. The end of the day, it doesn't matter. What it really matters is how are we getting along? I told y'all I'm through. I'm almost, I'm, I got to come back next week because I, can I come back next week with this finish? Because I got to, I got to close. But my mind isn't where, my mind isn't where it wanted to be. But but Cain rose up and killed Abel, and God says, uh, uh, Cain, where's your brother Abel? And Cain says, Lord, I I don't know. So Cain didn't even think, God, you sovereign, you already know what I've done. Cain just said, Lord, I don't know, as though he's trying to trick God. God, I don't know. <laughs> See, Cain lost it all. He doesn't even recognize God's sovereignty. God, I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? I want to go after the lost brothers and sisters that we have. I don't just want to get them in church. I want to get them in Jesus. I want them to understand that Yahshua, I want them to understand that this, this, this man who felt at home in Egypt, this man who had hair like wool and this dark complected brother could die on Calvary's cross to save a wretch like me. I come back next week, I promise you, but I, I got to deal with the fact 
And when Cain is given a consequence, say consequence. I don't know why folk think love doesn't have consequences. Well, if you love me, you let me get away. No, if I love you, I'm going to check you. Why, why, why do folk, I got to close, why do folk think that love means letting you get away whatever you want to get away with? No. How many of you in here, you love your child so much that you made them get a switch off the tree? I know that. I don't know that love or abuse. I think that's abuse. That might be abuse. <laughs> I mean, some of y'all are too young to even know about a switch. Y'all too young to know about a switch. I thought my mama was abused. Son, go get me a switch so you can spank me with it. I, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I gotta go. Come on, come on, Jamie. Will you help me? Um, I, I want to spend next week talking about this. Why is it? that God now covers him. You just committed murder. You didn't even, even recognize my sovereignty, but God told him, no matter where you go, but you can't stay here. See, love doesn't mean I allow you back in the same space. So can we go here next week? Why does God cover him? when he just committed murder. Father, I pray today that you would forgive my inadequacies.